Congratulations. Yes. And I've watched this now twice. The film is so rich. Yeah. There's so much history that, you know, I consider myself someone who has studied American history and African American history for many, many years, and I hardly knew anything. Did you learn a lot? So much. Now, you were born in Memphis. Yes, I was. How much of what you discovered in creating this film did you know before deciding to create it? In terms of the history, I knew hardly anything about the history of Memphis. I didn't even know about uh, Robert Church, which was the most important. I'd never heard of him. Never heard of him before. Uh, my mother told me that they uh, taught about him in class, but she didn't even know the extent to his contributions to Beale Street. Well, and Robert Church, as uh, Deborah told you, I had Eddie on my show a couple weeks ago, and so we talked for an hour, which we promised we won't do today. <laughs> but there's some tidbits. Something very interesting about Mr. Church, mm -hmm. which you saw in the film, is that his father was white, yeah. and his mother was an enslaved woman. Very often, that this occurred, but rarely did the white father claim the child. Can you talk about what you know about that relationship? Because you know there are many, many, many people who were offspring of slave owners who weren't positioned for success. Right, so uh, we don't know, uh, or historians don't know uh, why Robert Church's father claimed him, but he did. And Robert Church got a lot of his education on the Mississippi River steamboats. I mean, he was around guys who were gamblers, who were, you know, just tricksters doing this and that. And he got his education from that. Um, and he was around a lot of uh, white um, aristocrats. And, you know, he used that later in life to, to build a dynasty. And tell us a little bit about the brothels, because you told me about yeah. this. You know, for a black man right. to create successful brothels, who were the clients? How did he set that up? So Robert Church uh, created brothels uh, for white men, and most of the prostitutes in the brothels were white women. However, the, the, the catch was a lot of the brothels were in black neighborhoods because a lot of these distinguished white men didn't want to be seen during the day or at night going into brothels. And so nobody would check for them in black neighborhoods, so he put them in black neighborhoods. And he knew the neighborhoods because he was a black man. He was a black man, correct. That's, that's a fascinating yeah. story. And, and just staying with the church family for a moment, we have the sense that Church Senior was, well, he was the first black millionaire in the South. Correct. He gave that wealth and knowledge to his son who went on, but Crump, who was more powerful, maybe not as wealthy, but more powerful, yeah. was able to completely destroy everything. Yeah, completely destroy and just emasculate Robert Church. Yes. Um, you know, one thing I would say about Robert Church Sr. before I go on to that, yes is that he also had a daughter named Mary Church Terrell. I don't know if you know about Mary Church She's, Terrell. Uh, so I am a member of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated, and she was one of the founders. <laughs> right. and, and for those of you who don't know, they're in, as so many things in the black community, our ancestors created organizations and institutions when we were not allowed to join the white institutions. So, as there are many sororities and fraternities that are general, i.e. white sororities and fraternities, we weren't allowed in those. And as a result, Correct. there were several made uh, for black people. The second, the first was Alpha Kappa Alpha sorority and the second Delta Sigma Theta. And they're public service organizations. And when you join, you become a public servant in that organization for life. And I'm a member of Delta, and she was one of the founders. She was one of the founders, and she was also a part of the uh, suffrage movement. She had a uh, relationship with Susan B. Anthony, and also founded an organization uh, uh, specifically for uh, black women, 
Um, it kind of escapes me what the name of it is right now, but you can, you know, Google it. Was she part of um, National Council of Negro Women? I'm not sure, because I know that was... Um well, uh, it, it, was, it was probably so, but uh, it was called Colored Women. Um, so maybe, I don't right. know if that's the same organization. I'm not sure. Uh, yeah. and, and Dorothy Height was with National Council right. of Negro Women. But in any case, a powerful family. But power is relative. Mm -hmm. Because we saw when Crump had no more use for it. You saw the picture with the Lincoln Republicans? So my father was a Republican during that period. Yeah. There, many black people were Republicans. Mm -hmm. And when there was no more use for them, Crump annihilated everything. He annihilated everything. I mean, Robert Church, well, first the Lincoln, I mean, it was called the Lincoln League because it was the party of Lincoln. And, you know, of course, a lot of blacks were, uh, were in that, uh, were a part of the Republican Party because of Lincoln. Um, but uh, in terms of uh, Crump just totally annihilating uh, Robert Church's wealth in Robert Church's um, his home, Robert Church and including his father, never paid taxes on that house. Um, and so when Crump uh, didn't have any use for him anymore, and when Church got too big for his britches, so to speak, he said, okay, well, you owe this amount of money on this house for all these years. Now, his father had the house uh, in the late 1800s. The house burned down in 1953, I want to say. That's a lot of back taxes. So that's a lot of back taxes <laughs> on the house, and of course, uh, Robert Church Jr. couldn't afford that. Right. And so Crump kicked that him out. That was the loophole. And he burned it down. Mm. Let's go on to the, the through line in the movie, which is Jookin. Right. This dance form, which didn't it look like they were on point, but in sneakers? I, I just kept yeah. thinking, are they going to break their toes? Are they going to break I their know. ankles? Some of those moves, one of them is called breaking your ankle, right? Yeah, one of them is called breaking your ankles. When you go on your toe and just kind of bend it like that, uh, you know, some, some of those guys actually have to go to the chiropractor right now at, at 25 years old because they don't have the correct shoes. So I, I told you before, one of the things I do is to coach many people, including young artists, before they are going out into the world to tell their story. And recently, I've been working with a number of young black male rappers right. in Atlanta, in uh, the Maryland area, in California. And many of them are, all of them are in gangs, mm -hmm. and dipping in and out of a life of crime. Right. One of the things that I thought was very powerful that a young man said at the end of your film about Jukin is that this was a way for them not to fall into the trap of crime and drugs and and illegal activity. Can you talk about that? Yeah, so, you know, uh, I think the, the young man, he goes by the name of Lil Black, his name is Jonathan uh, Foster. Um, but he's a prime example of what, you know, Jukin has done for his life. He's traveled to, you know, he said Amsterdam and China and, you know, all these other places. And But he's not the only one. There have been at least 10 other dancers who've traveled around the world because of Jukin. And uh, because of that, um, it's not only uh, made them stay out of street life, uh, but it's introduced them to uh, another life. Um, and so they have this new kind of, uh, I would say, kind of aspiration or kind of hope to kind of uh, strive for. And then there was the school, thanks to Clinton. Yeah. And the huge millions of dollars, was it $21 million, I think it was? Yeah, I think she said the city of Memphis was granted $28 million, I believe. Well, a huge amount yeah. of money, and then that was snatched. Yeah. So what happens to, I mean, we saw the hope. We saw that they were in this artistic school, and now that's gone. Yeah. How are these dancers today making money? Do people, because they're, we sh you showed them right. outside dancing. They're not getting paid to do that. Yeah, they're not getting paid to do that. A lot of them aren't making money. Um, is, there are only a few of them, mainly Little Buck. He's the face of Memphis Shook, and uh, Little Buck has been fortunate to, because of uh, Yo Memphis, Yo Academy, he's yes. been fortunate enough to be able to dance with Yo-Yo Ma, uh, Madonna, um, and he's gotten access to all these circles. He's in Nike commercials, Apple commercials. 
Um, so he's really the forefront of uh, Memphis juking. Um, and there's a couple other guys who are uh, making a little bit of money, but for the most part, these guys aren't making money like that. You know, and you know, this dance is, you know, th what they've made is phenomenal and the, the industry that they've created is phenomenal. And you know, for these guys not to be making little to nothing is just crazy. And there was discussion about it. At the end of the film, right. there was a lot of contemplation about how they can support the community and do more than what they're doing now, give it some economic grounding. Right. Has, you finished this film a year ago, right? Mm -hmm. Which is five minutes ago in terms of I raising know. money. <laughs> uh, have any strides been made to help them to, to earn any money? Uh, in terms of the city helping them, no, no. Not, not that I know of. I mean, you know, they definitely need some kind of city uh, or government undergirding mm -hmm. to, you know, fund them and finance them and, and so that they can be successful. But without that, it, it's, it's, it's really no hope for them, to be honest with you. And I tell them that, too. Um, and so part of this film, why I made this film, uh, is to incentivize people so that they can they can go and, and, and you know, um, create some kind of action and create some kind of, um, you know, I guess, fruit from that action so that these, these guys can have a, uh, not only a, a place to dance, but just they can have opportunities to make money off of dance mm -hmm. instead of just being in, you know, Memphis. Another image that we saw in, in tearing down of an image was of the statue of Jefferson Davis. Right. And uh, it, it's interesting, this, this movement to tear down the statues and, and have people rally around this and, and what has occurred. Just the other day I was talking to my husband, we live in Harlem, and there's a statue that was removed of someone called Marion Sims. Mm. And my husband said, why do they take it down? We didn't know who he was you know, it, and taking it down, does that change anything? Mm. And so we're driving down Fifth Avenue, we pass uh, the, the, the stand, because now the statue's gone, and I looked it up and learned that this particular person was a genius in medicine, figured out all kinds of things to help women, like fistula is one of the diseases that women had. He figured out ways to help women with reproductive issues, yeah. but used enslaved women without anesthesia it should have been taken down and so we argued about this <laughs> but because it was taken down I looked it up I'd rode by that statue for 30 years I never knew. I've seen it and so this what what happened for the community rallying around Jefferson Davis because I wonder if people even knew who he was so but not only just Jefferson Davis but they took down I think more importantly they took down Nathan Bedford Forrest Okay, Nathan right Bedford here. Forrest was the first Grand Wizard of the Ku Klux Klan. He made his fortune off of slave trade. He got rich off of selling slaves in Memphis. He's also infamous for the battle at Fort Pillow in the Civil War. Many people don't know about that, but after the Battle of Port Philo, uh, Fort Pillow, there were a number, over 300 of uh, Negro uh, Confederate soldiers and white soldiers who surrendered and he brutally he had this army brutally massacred all of them all of them and so you know Nathan Bedford Forrest was uh, that statue was put up I believe in the 19 teens or the 1920s as a uh, intimidation mechanism against the uh, Bill Street Merchants Association which empowered uh, black uh, business owners to have businesses. And so that was a reminder to, uh, you know, put them in their place. So were the various statues taken down at around the same time? Yeah, in the Jefferson Davis and Nathan Bedford Forrest were taken down the same night. Wow, very good, yeah. very good. And again, to the point of awareness, because awareness was brought by activists, right. Do you believe that, in particular, young people came to learn what those people represented? Yeah, oh, definitely. I mean, you know, uh, my grandparents uh, grew up with the statue. 
I mean, they've seen it all, their whole lives. And I remember, I, you know, I, I don't know if they knew the extent of his history, um, but they were, I guess, kind of like your husband, like, why did they do that? And I told them, like, you know who he was? And they didn't say anything, so I, I guess them not saying anything, maybe it was confirmation that they didn't know or maybe they just didn't want to say. But, you know, I think, I think that history should not be erased, but I think that certain people shouldn't be made as heroes. Very good, very good, yeah. Now that's deserving of applause. You know, one of the things that you showed in the film that we have seen time and again, maybe a few people here, you may have seen it in real time, just really depends on your age and where you were in the country, but you know, the colored and white yeah. bathrooms and water fountains and all of that kind of thing. And, and to the same point about what you see and what you don't see, uh, I remember, I'm from Baltimore, when I was a little girl, going with my mother into this store that she loved. And my mother's a very light-skinned black woman, and I'm obviously brown, and I have two sisters who are somewhere uh, on the spectrum. <laughs> <laughs> and we walk into the store, with, and, and my younger sister's in a stroller, and the saleswoman says to my mother, what are you doing with those black children? True story. And I never forgot. And my mother turned on her heels. Well, she said, these are my children. And then she turned on her heels and left. But many years later, like 25 years later, we went into this store, which is still there. And I remembered this. And I asked my mother, why do you go to that store? Do you remember? And she said, if I remembered every store that didn't let me shop, wow. every business that offended me, because she's 89, so she grew up during segregation. Yeah. In Maryland, so it shouldn't have been that way. She said, I wouldn't go anywhere. So people, to survive, would turn a blind eye, which is what I think that gentleman, uh, Mr. Bailey, your namesake, who's in, in office, he said it took somebody from another town to come in yeah. to open his eyes. Yeah, um, yeah, that, that, was, that was pretty... It wasn't shocking to me, but it wasn't, I was like, yeah, I mean, you know, that would happen, especially in Memphis where, or in the South in general, like, okay, so I was born in Memphis, but grew up in Georgia. And so I remember uh, very vividly as a teenager, you would see um, pickup trucks with the uh, Confederate flag and a shotgun on the back all the time. And, you know, you go into the restaurants with them. You know? With the shotgun. Yeah, you know, like with, you know, you know, people that, you know. Uh, oh, with those was, people. With those people, had, right? yeah. And you, would, you wouldn't think too much of it, uh, but that was just the, this life in the South. You know, it's just life in the South. That, that's how it was. And so uh, one thing I'd like to say is that, you know, my cousin, Walter Bailey, who is the uh, longest serving uh, county commissioner in the country, he served for 44 years in Shelby County, um, I didn't know, this documentary helped me to discover a lot about my family. So through Juking, I got to really, like, really rediscover Memphis and thus rediscovering my family. Um, I'm also kin to his brother, D'Army Bailey, who I knew, but I didn't know his contributions to Memphis. So D'Army Bailey passed about three years ago, uh, but his biggest contribution to the city of Memphis was that he bought the uh, Lorraine Motel in 1981 for 30 grand. And 30 he, grand. Yeah. Wow. And he eventually opened it back up and made it the Civil Rights Museum. I didn't even know this. Cause and my, that's your uncle. That's my cousin. cousin. That's my cousin. I didn't even know this because my, grand, my grandparents, that generation, they didn't talk about anything like that. You know, they just kind of, you know, they just didn't talk about it. The only way you'll know about stuff is if you ask them. And how do you know what to ask them? You know, so... Um, through that, I learned that. And also, Walter Bailey was uh, a part of the legal team that brought Martin Luther King Jr. back to the city of Memphis on April 4th, 1968, when he got assassinated. And so I learned so much about my family through doing this doc, and, um, you know, I just had to put him in there. I'm so glad you did. And, you know, we know symbolically 
the Lorraine Hotel associated with Martin Luther King, honestly, if we took a poll, not necessarily here, but anywhere, how many people realized the Lorraine Hotel was in Memphis? You know, we get disconnected from history. People know that Dr. King was assassinated down south, right. but a lot of it becomes a blur. So it is, th this film was extremely helpful, I think, in, in reminding us of very important touch points in our history. Right, and two, you know, I think uh, he got assassinated. It was, you know, strategic for him to be assassinated in Memphis because this was the part of Dr. King's career when he was starting the Poor People's Campaign. That's he right. was talking about, specifically, he was talking about economics for for black folks because it says, okay, because they had already achieved civil rights. So it's, and he said, you know, it's one thing that I can have a hamburger by a white man, but if I can't afford it, then what's the point? And he was there because he was fighting for the sanitation workers and the sanitation workers were fighting for more money. They were fighting for uh, better uh, working conditions because two people had died in a dump truck and nobody in the, uh, the mayor at the time, Mayor Henry Loeb, he didn't care. And that's the I am a man, that iconic photograph right. that was shown in the film and you've probably seen before with the men walking with the signs, I am a man. That's am from a man. that. That's from that. And so he, when uh, Dr. King started really talking about, really what he was talking about was re redress. He was talking about reparations. He just didn't say that. But when he started talking about that, that's when he got assassinated. Well, so the conversation about reparations has never worked. It, he was assassinated, Malcolm X was assassinated. You know, prior to that, President Kennedy was assassinated, his brother was assassinated. I mean, when you talk about money, people get very uncomfortable. Yeah. And it, and it takes us back to the question I had about Jukin and money for those, those kids. I mean, really, look at all the arts institutions that we have that support young yeah. people you know, having taken the time to be able to develop the art form, and, and many of these institutions have millions of dollars, which was described right. even in Memphis. Right. So what what does it take? The the woman who who you we see in the film, who was the leader to help take the statues down, is running for office right now. Is that correct? Her name is Tammy Sawyer. Uh, she was uh, one of the. Uh, the lead organizers in the Take Em Down 901 movement. Um, and Tammy Sawyer during that time was running for Shelby County Commissioner. And so I never, get a, I never got a chance to interview Tammy Sawyer, uh, but I was fortunate enough to get her in her element. Uh, but she is running for mayor now and against a, uh, the current mayor, Jim Strickland. If Tammy Sawyer wins, she will not only be the first woman mayor in Memphis, Tennessee, she'll be the first African-American woman mayor in the history of uh, Memphis. And, and what are her chances? What, what is, if you, you know, you read the leaves, what does it look like? Well, Memphis is still 65% uh, black, give or take. Um, so I think your chances are pretty good. And a lot of people are disgruntled with the, uh, the current uh, administration. So I think she has a pretty good chance. Uh, but, you know, again, you got to see what um, her agenda is too. So you, you show in the film the, the power that is often uh, wielded over the vote because there was the poll tax was one of many uh, yeah. illegal things put upon black people so it would be difficult right. for them to vote after fighting to get the right to vote. Right. And 1965, correct? Was, mm. was it 60, Voting Rights Act and then... It was the uh, Civil Rights I, I, Act. The Civil Rights Act was 64. And, I and think Voting Rights Act right is 65. There. So just think about that. Before 1965, half of the country of black people could not vote. I was born in 61. It's crazy. Yeah. And the unfortunate thing is that all people in America, I mean, there's such a small number of people who vote. There's incredible apathy in our country, whatever your uh, background is, but especially it is, it's disheartening that so few black people vote when people died so that we could vote. Mm. I mean, it, so I, it'll be interesting to see if that 65% come out because there was another figure that you showed 
still 88% of the dollars for businesses go to white men. Right. This is a problem. So, you know, even, um, you know, black men got the right to vote uh, after, during Reconstruction, um, but they have this thing called states' rights. And so with states' rights, you know, so the federal government may say one thing, but they leave it up to states to, the states to do whatever they want to do. So in the South, uh, even though they had the right to vote, they had a lot of blockades, you know, and, uh, that were, um, that deterred them from voting. And a lot of those blockades were violent acts of terror. Yes. And so. And trickery. Know, yeah. I mean, you know, at times you had to read something, but, you know, it, during slavery, it was illegal to, for black people to learn how to read. So right. most people couldn't read because it was illegal. And then the money, there's so many things that occurred to right. thwart the vote. Right. So, you know, I, you know, I, and even with, uh, you know, Reverend Barber fighting for, you know, states like North Carolina where they're really cracking down on uh, uh, preventing African-Americans from voting. I, you know, I, I just kind of think that, you know, when, when, we, when there's an election, I think that, you know, it's historical that black folks turn out in, in major numbers to vote. Um, but, you know, you have to understand, you know, through mass incarceration and, Things of that nature. A lot of a lot of black men just cannot vote. If you have a felony, you cannot vote. That's right. That's just what it is. And so a lot of those a lot of the voting rights are taken away from us. And so you know, it's a very complicated conversation and deeply rooted in That's American so. history as to why you know some people vote and some people don't because a lot of people I think in this day and age want some kind of tangibles for their vote. And if they're not having any tangibles or there's not any agenda, real agenda on the table that promote change, then I think the, the attitude for not only African Americans, but for a lot of people is why, mm -hmm. so. I wanna open it up for questions, yes. And we have a microphone, so if you raise your hand, we'll bring a microphone to you. So I think we're gonna reach this lady first and then you'll be second, okay? Oh, okay. Well, it's not this lady, but... I'm sorry. <laughs> Sir, yes? Um, first of all, props to you for the movie. I learned so much about Memphis. Thank you, thank that you. That I didn't know. Um, I've got quite a few questions, but I'll only ask a few. Could you talk a little bit more about what happened to the kids who were in the lower school at Yo Memphis? What, what did they go back to regular school or what happened to them? Uh, um, I've got a couple more. Okay. Uh, I noticed that um, you didn't mention much about the blues. You had some great blues singers that came out of Memphis, B.B. Yeah. King being um, certainly one of uh, the most well-known one. And so I assume it was just a matter of time that you could only do but so much. Yeah. Next question was when the kids are dancing in the parking lots, what what music are they listening to and and where are they playing it from and um, Okay, we got it. Last three, question. Three. Last question. <laughs> uh, what's going to happen to this film and what's happened so far? Okay, so the first question was what? <laughs> I forgot Went Yo Memphis. Oh, say so a lot of them went to different schools um, Some of them did not well some of them didn't that, that's, that's the short story. I didn't talk to a lot of the uh, kids who, who were there and left. I just talked to one uh, little buck, uh, you know, who graduated from there. But from what I was told by the teacher, uh, Dr. Marie, Marie Milam, I'm sorry, she was a principal, Dr. Marie, Marie Milam, um, a lot of the kids went to different public schools and some of them did well and some of them, you know, didn't. Um, I think your second question was about the blues. Um, well, I, I didn't want to go too deep into the blues because if I did, then it would become another documentary. And I had to kind of stay on course. So I had to talk about it, you know, I had to give cliff notes of the blues instead of like going into like Muddy Waters and, and Robert Johnson and, you know, all those and um, all those blues players. I'm thinking of some more names, but I can't think of them right now. Um, Dancing in the parking lot. They don't have anywhere to go. 
Uh, they don't, they, there's not a lot, there's one uh, academy called uh, Lottie Yates Entertainment. Mm -hmm. You saw her on the documentary. She opens her studio up every Friday night for Freestyle Fridays. Um, but other than that, they just go into these, there's a lot of empty malls in Memphis, mm -hmm. like shopping areas, it's just empty, just businesses just gone, especially in South Memphis. Um, there's a lot of empty parking lots. So they just go there, they blast music, the kind of music, Memphis hip hop. Memphis hip hop, Juicy J, DJ Paul, DJ Zerg, DJ Squeaky. Uh, if you looked at the credits, you could see that music yeah. was all local. Yeah, all local yeah. music that they danced to because that is the rhythm, that is the bounce. That, that, that's, that is what drives Juk and that bounce, that music. Um, so what is happening with this film? Uh, this film was uh, released February 19th. Uh, the distributor is Gravitas Ventures. We released it on all major streaming platforms, Amazon Prime, iTunes, Google Play, Vimeo, Vudu, Xbox, Video On Demand. You can go buy it and rent it now. <laughs> and remember that's Memphis Magic with a J and the J is for Jukin. <laughs> and and I, I just wanna add one thing before we go to the next question. When you asked about where they're doing it and it's in a parking lots where they can find, Going back to the young men that I work with, what I have heard people talk about when they don't have this creativity that they're pooling together is an example. As a kid, there was no playground. This true story, recent story. So what this one guy's friends and he would do is to get rocks and go on the overpass of the highway and throw rocks at cars. Not understanding that that was a bad thing to do boys wanting an outlet and and when what what did he call the the um get buck get buck yeah that so if, if you're getting buck through your body in a way that's not hurting someone yeah. how creative and innovative and safe yeah but what many people today right now where there aren't playgrounds where there aren't after school activities there's no boys club they are committing violent acts against each other, getting involved in drugs and all kinds of other things. Yeah, definitely. Um, and you know, the, the, go ahead, I'm sorry. Yes. I love this film. Thank I you so much. I absolutely loved, and I love this conversation. And I did want to add something. I was a site selector for national chain retailers for, thir for almost 30 years, and did extensive research on the economy of Memphis during the course of my career at intervals. And at one time, Memphis was more viable than it is today. And the thing that I would add is that during the predatory lending mm -hmm. um, party that uh, the predatory lenders were having during the early, you know, 2000 into 2008, Memphis was their number one wow. target. And one Target. of the reasons that Memphis is poorer today is that people lost their homes and the ability yeah. to um, earn the appreciated value from home ownership. So that's a very negative story, but I want to add that what I picked up from this film was something so positive that those kids were doing it for something larger than themselves. Right. Mm -hmm. They were doing it for Memphis. Right. That's and right. that is a beautiful story to tell. Thank you for Thank sharing you so that. Much. Next question. Thank you. I'm somewhat disappointed in the film because as I mentioned, my husband is a native of Memphis and yeah. he can't do any of that. <laughs> <laughs> he can't Neither dance. Neither can I. He can't sing, <laughs> but on another note, it brought back such positive and negative memories for me in the 80s as a member of the uh, board of the Memphis Heritage Society. Mm. Uh, Beale Street was dead, downtown was dead, the Orpheum was dead, and it's not dead anymore. And I think it's a testament to what the arts and music, and people who care about the community do for revitalization of a city like Memphis that means so much. So I would say thank you, and if you want to comment on the 
cont contribution of music. And, oh, I, I would add, our nephew designed B.B. King's sign. Oh. oh, congratulations. Awesome. Thank you. Next question, please. You did a fabulous job. And um, I wanted to know if there was any way that they could patent the dance or trademark it, because then they, they would have something to say, this is what we've done, and we could teach it. You know, that, that's one of the questions that I had. And I love the history that you gave, because a lot of stuff I didn't know myself. And if they could get grant writers to write grants so that they could have a school or either get funding, because I, I have friends that, that write grants for different things for different communities. So have they ever thought about doing something in that vein? That's a good question. Um, I'm sure little Buck has. Uh, I, I know little Buck is trying to open a school in Las Vegas. Uh, I don't know why Vegas. Um, um, but there's a guy in the film named Tarek Moore who I think would definitely benefit from your contacts because he stays in Memphis. He never left Memphis. And the reason why he never left Memphis is because he loves Memphis. And he wants everything that has to do with juking to be anchored in Memphis. Now, uh, in terms of them uh, patenting the name or uh, the dance style, I don't know how they can actually do that, but what they have been doing through Lil Buck is when Lil Buck goes on national TV, when he goes on Empire or uh, any show on national television, he will say, this is Memphis Jukin. It comes from Memphis. And that has resonated to the point where The Simpsons have done, they just did a, uh, a new episode and Bart, was doing Memphis Jukin. They said Memphis Jukin on All the right. Simpsons. And he was doing some of Buck's moves. So I, I don't know if they can like patent a dance. Uh, they, can, I, I, they might be able to trademark the name, but. Uh, yeah. yeah. But you know, uh, what they're doing is uh, when they're getting on national TV, they're saying this specific style is Memphis Jukin. And so that, 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 that's a start right there, but we can talk afterwards. Question? Yes. Um, I just want to say it's a brilliant piece of protest literature as film. Um, social commentary, it's, I think what you need to do is show this film in Memphis for voter registration and community activism and agency. There is That's no question idea. that if your community sees this film, that it will galvanize the vote out so that you can change the political landscape of Memphis. When you've got 65 to 68% of the population as African American, this is the film that they need to see. Because I have to tell you, I am going home and I am going to Google everything about Memphis that I can possibly <laughs> Google from Robert Church on down. And I know everybody in this room is going to do yeah. the same thing. We are going to get on Google and blow Google, Google up in terms of Memphis. <laughs> it is such a love, love affair that you have with this yeah. city. It is so obvious from this film. This is a film that you need to take back to change Memphis from a political, social, cultural, social standpoint. It is absolutely a brilliant piece of filmmaking. I was riveted, I think everybody else was riveted. As you can see, we're sitting here and we're listening to this commentary and we're going, yes, 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 yes. I also have to give a shout out to Deborah Royce. Deborah, this was absolutely brilliant and we need to give her a hand right yes. now. Yeah. Because this was awesome. It was just, it rocked the house. Um, the other thing I wanna know is, um, who was the young man who talked about giving this dance form a vocabulary? Mm. Was, that, was that who you were talking about, Tariq? Is that no, who you're that, talking about? That, that, that was Daniel. Okay, he is also fantastic. Yeah. He dope. understands that in order to legitimate this, 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 this type of a dance right. form, it has to be codified, and that's what he's saying. He mm -hmm. understands that to make this last, we have to codify it and give it legitimacy. And so again, that's also a form of using it as protest literature. Right. If we can name it, if we can codify it, it becomes something positive and real that we can use for protest lit. I think, again, brilliant filmmaking. And it becomes so more much. more than just a trend dance. Exactly, it's a right. real it's really dance. Fat, it it's a genre. Yes. yes. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Question. What is the word? Where did the word "juckin" come from? And um, is there a comeback to the economy of Memphis at this point? 
because we saw a lot of blighted areas and we yeah. hear a lot about blight. Um, is anything coming back, helping it come back? Uh, first question, where does the term juking come from? It comes from juke, or juke joints. Uh, and I think that term came from Irish jukes or jigs. And it was, I, I don't know how it got um, identified with the African American community, but it did. And so, you know, they still have juke joints or juke joints in Mississippi, which is five miles from Memphis anyway. And so that's where the name juke came from. It's a juke, it's a dance. Um, in terms of Memphis coming back, I mean, like uh, many other cities like DC, New York, uh, Los Angeles, Oakland, San Francisco, Memphis is being, they're going through gentrification. So it's coming back in that way um, through, you know, displacing a lot of folks. Um, but yeah, that's the answer. Well, you know, one of the things that's happening in, in Detroit, which from where Deborah hails, and I think it's good and bad, a lot of blight. Some of those houses were like $5,000, and people have come in and bought individual houses, but also blocks. Sometimes when you buy the blocks, it becomes gentrified, but hopefully some of it will be preserved for the yeah. community. Next over here. Um, I, I'm interested in how, since this is your first movie, how you got, how you came to, to do How did you do and, that? And, and in, and it, I mean, because it, it's so extraordinarily put together. Um, but back to this lady's comment. Um, so that's my, my question to you, but <laughs> this isn't a Memphis thing. This is the, walking out the door. It's today. What, what yeah. do you mean? <laughs> the mess. Oh, yeah. yes. Yeah, th th it, this can it's, be. It's happening. Yeah. It's it just. Thank you for doing this movie. No, you're so but, welcome. But, but it's 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 not Memphis. I mean, it's Memphis. This but can be Memphis. This can be Oakland. Stanford, it's out the door. It's right. The next town. This can be Camden. This can be Newark. This can That's be right. Brooklyn. It's there. It's Stanford. It's yeah. Stanford. Right. This can be any. Any city in America, right, that has a, a, a black population, yeah. Um, but I, I, I <laughs> and and so you know, I just think that you know, as a uh, a, a black American uh, man who you grew up in the South and who's had a lot of uh, experience uh, living in the East Coast, you know, this is just the the, the history and the story of just our people in general. I mean, it just is, and we have to tell it. And this is the, the story of America. Um, and until that is repaired, until you know, there is some redress, it'll always be like that. And so we have to talk about it. Couple threads I want to say here. One, I, I gotta go back to the shout out to Deborah and give just a little bit more context. Because we were talking about Black Lives Matter, and you know, that, which is, has been a pulse point for a few years. And the conversation that she and I had, which I know many of you who have been part of this community were having is, you know, what, what can you do? What can we do? How can we create a conversation that isn't polarizing but that brings together black people and white people and other people to have an honest conversation about what's going on. And if we can do it through film and find films that set the stage for an honest, probing conversation, maybe we can do something. I appreciate your tears. These are tears that we shed all the time, unfortunately. But through that, you know, through, through the, the Filmmaking that helps to churn up the emotion and bring forth tears, for some of us it creates action. And we need to take action in order to make a change. And I wanna say, to answer, I'll answer you part of the question, 
because my project is Dream Leapers. It's about helping people access and activate their dreams. Why I wanted to talk to Eddie on my show, Dream Leapers, was because his work in film and television, which we didn't talk about at all, many years of learning how to create content. This is his, this is Eddie's first film. But Eddie didn't just start in this industry. How many years have you been refining your skills? 16. Yeah. And so this is his first feature film, but he's got 16 years of, of refinement in storytelling through the, this visual moving image. Next question. Okay, you're next, and then we'll go on this side. Yep. Thank you for all your questions and participation. It's wonderful. I live in Stanford. I have twin 16-year-old grandchildren, and they've been taking hip-hop for 10 years uh, here in Stanford, and they absolutely love it. It's just wonderful for them, and it, if more people could take that, it would be amazing. That said, I'm a little disappointed that I didn't think of it, but what a shame that more of the students from our community couldn't have been here tonight to see this film. I think they're the ones that need to see it almost more than we do because I think it would influence their lives if they could see what went on, what's going on, and have the hope of what could happen yeah. if they were pro proactive. The students are always invited. It's something that does happen through actively through the Avon Theater. I have a an almost 16-year-old daughter, and I can tell you, I would not have let her come today because they're at, at, we didn't realize this at this when we were planning this timing, but there's way too much homework. It's getting toward the end of school, and to be this late out would be difficult. But what can happen, because Eddie told us, this film is available. <laughs> it's, so tell your families. You know, kids watch everything. All of these platforms, they can watch it. You can watch it with them and have a conversation. It'll be great. A good friend of mine uh, told me that uh, he showed it to one of his friends, and his friend showed it to his, uh, his uh, three boys, and they had friends over. And he put on the film and went somewhere. And he was nervous because they were so quiet. And so he went back and saw them watching the film. And that's how um, that's good. intrigued. I, I mean, I'm, I, I purposely made this for millennials. Uh, I didn't give it a lot of breaths, like in between the transitions. It's not like a lot of room to breathe. I just go right into the next thing because I wanted, you know, millennials to be uh, engaged so they wouldn't lose the attention so they get a little bit of dancing but they get a, a history lesson at the same time. I thought that was brilliant the way that the the dancing the history was interwoven with the dance because kids do not want you to tell them that you're giving them a history lesson. Right. <laughs> They're like never mind. <laughs> Next question. Oh over here yes. Uh, thank you so much. I, I love the film for all the reasons that I've, everyone has said, but for me as a former dancer, what I really appreciated most was the dancing. Uh, and what I found extraordinary was that uh, the form was so, uh, as if they were professionally trained, but they yes. weren't professionally trained. Right. And I thought I was watching Twyla Tharp dancers. Mm. I, are you familiar with her work at all? I'm not. I am. Okay, so I, 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 that's what I want to research because I'm just wondering if she spent some time down there. Um, you should take a look <laughs> at her work and you'll, you'll see it. I mean, I, I just really initially thought that's what I was watching was... Wow. Yeah. Yeah. You, you know, so she's the, at an American modern ballet, icon. Cunningham technique. Yeah. You know, a very distinctive style, danced with sneakers, um, a lot of the moves very similar. So, so I just found it, I found it really fascinating. Um, yeah, it's interesting. I mean, you know, these guys, you know, they've, you know, this dance is 30 years old. Um, so at first it didn't start off as that, it started off as a step. Uh, the gangster step. The gangster walk. The gangster walk. It. Right. it was a, um, a step, 
And from that step, that's, just, that, that's the foundation of every move that they do from the gangster walk and getting buck, which is the buck jump. Uh, from that, you know, you can branch off into any move in Jukin. So that's the foundation of uh, the dance. And it took 30 years for them to uh, even start to think about getting on their toes and, and doing all this stuff uh, because they had to get the foundation uh, solidified first. But to your point, you know, it will be interesting to go back and look at Twyla Tharp's work to, to see, yeah. you know, how derivative it might be. Uh, we saw, many people have talked about Elvis over the years and all of the things that he so handily borrowed from the black community <laughs> uh, and never gave credit for. We'll see if it's true by Ms. Twyla. We'll look. <laughs> yes, Deborah. Would a dancer do the same dance again if, if he or she, you know, had multiple performances, or is it improvisational every time? Most of the dances are uh, improvised, uh, but some of the dancers in uh, Little Buck, uh, a guy named Miles Yachts, and Trent, the guy that you saw uh, dancing at the end, the lighter skinned black guy that you mm -hmm. saw dancing at the end, and in the very beginning, are uh, have had some training. As a matter of fact, Trent dances in Cirque de um, Soleil mm -hmm. out in Vegas. Or Cirque de Soul, how do you Soleil. pronounce it? Soleil. Soleil, out in Vegas. Um, so a few of the guys are trained, but even the guys that aren't trained, they're willing to be, you know, uh, become trained um, because this is what they want to do. So. It's kind of like jazz. Yeah. In, in, in a sense. Right, right. In an improv sense. But I, what was interesting to me as I watched, I grew to notice certain steps. Did you? In certain moves that many of them were able to make, and even the little ones attempting. Like, I think I would break my ankle if I tried it, but they were doing that breaking the ankle move. But there were a few moves that we got to see again and again. Who's next? Yes. Hi, I'm Carol Herring Henderson. Hey, Carol. If you hear a southern accent, yep. <laughs> um, I want to make a, um, a comment, a suggestion, and then a fast question. Mm -hmm. My comment is, um, it was so meaningful to me while you were talking about how you didn't understand your history growing up in Memphis. I didn't understand the history of Hattiesburg, Mississippi, where I graduated high school 50 years ago this yeah. year because there's two R's in the name of the county. Hattiesburg is the county seat of Forest County. Mm -hmm. We can tear down statues. How do we tear down the name of a county that celebrates? Anyway, that's my comment. My suggestion is, oh, how wonderful to, to show this to, to, young, to millennials, to the younger. And two, two ideas came to mind. Uh, tonight, I'd like to imagine that some of the people who are at the Facing Racism Weekly group might have been here instead if it wasn't meeting on Wednesday. Mm. So um, Facing Racism is funded by Everyday Democracy. It's a series of, con of facilitated conversations. It was, it's had three sessions already. The first series was at the library. The second series was in a church. And right now they're halfway through the series at the uh, Domus um, Social Services Agency, which is the same location for Trailblazers Academy Middle School. They have a beautiful auditorium. So Facing Racism is partnering with Domus, who have um, invested in a, uh, a training vehicle called the Two and a Half Day Undoing Racism Workshop. And um, they also uh, host monthly conversations called Connecticut Undoing Racism. And all of this is happening in Stanford. So it let's talk, let me make sure you all talk. That's my suggestion. Right. And so my question was, 
Do y'all know anybody in Hattiesburg, Mississippi? Because I think I'm not the only one who doesn't understand who Nathan Bedford Forrest was. I don't know anybody in Hattiesburg, Mississippi, um, but we can definitely talk about the uh, organization you're with because that organization needs to see this film, all of them, at the same yes. time. Thank you. Question. Any more questions or comments in the back? that the daughter was active in uh, the suffrage movement. And I put some flyers out on the table that the Lockwood Matthews Museum in Norwalk is doing a major suffrage exhibit Wonderful. starting tomorrow, going through November. And I would highly recommend it to the people who would, li who would like this story, because suffrage is the answer. Wonderful. Well, Eddie, thank you for making a brilliant film. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, it's wonderful. Thank you so much. I think it sparked a lot of really important conversation. Let's continue the conversation. Please tell your friends about Memphis Magic, M-A-J-I-C. Very easy to find and share it with others. That's Thank right. you.